Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Love of Life podcast. And today we have special guest, Dr. George Grant, coming up on the Love of Life podcast. Christian education. Because it serves him who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Is the love of life. This is the Love of Life podcast, conversations with Jesse and Courtney. And we are welcoming Dr. George Grant to the podcast. I'm going to read a little intro before we get started. Dr. Grant is the pastor of the Parish Presbyterian Church, director of the King's Meadow Study Center, founder of both Franklin Classical School and Bannockburn College, and coordinator of the Chalmers Fund. He is the author of dozens of books in the areas of history, biography, politics, literature, and social criticism, and he's written hundreds of essays, articles, and columns. And that's just a few of the things that he's done and is doing, and we're very excited to have him on today. How are you, Dr. Grant? I am great. It's a joy to be with you. Absolutely. It's a joy to be with you. Well, let's get started. Uh, I want to start the, just from the top. Why does history matter? Isn't history just a bunch of random names and dates and details. Um, after all, we have smartphones and they didn't in the past. I mean, isn't the future the only thing that's relevant at this point? Why would you say history uh, matters? Well, one of the things that uh, the Bible tells us is that it is important for us to learn from the past so that we don't make all the same mistakes. Um, it's important for us to learn from the past because there's nothing new under the sun. And therefore, as we learn the lessons of the past, we understand how we got to where we are presently and how we can follow that trajectory to where we're going in the future. Uh, but in addition to all of that, history is the record of God's sovereign working with men and nations. And so we look at history and we start to make connections and we can see God's hand in it all. Uh, and that <clears throat> will then obviously help us in the present uh, to calibrate our own actions facing our own times of adversity. It also helps us understand that uh, whatever difficulties we're facing, these are not unprecedented times. Uh, you hear that all the time uh, during COVID. Uh, people talked about how unprecedented all of this was, which just tells me that they don't know the story of history. They know nothing about the 8th century or the 14th century or the 17th century, for that matter. So... Uh, for all of those reasons, history is really important. Of course, the, the other thing we have to remember is that history is not actually what happened. It's what we remember of what happened. Mm. And uh, therefore, there are always these gaps. And oftentimes, the most fruitful endeavors that we can undertake are looking at the gaps and recovering those lost bits that uh, that can perhaps make sense of where we are presently and how we ought to act. Mm. That's wonderful. Um, you alluded to some time periods that have already relevance to where we're at now, but is there any, any other time period you'd say to look at if we want to know a reference point for where we are and where we could be going? Well, there's so many, obviously, Looking back to the birth of Christianity uh, and the the sort of the waning years of Roman strength, the Roman Empire endured for a really long time after it was strong. Uh, but looking at those days is incredibly helpful. Uh, Tom Holland has written a, a wonderful book entitled Dominion. Uh, uh, Holland is a Greco-Roman scholar. Uh, and an unbeliever who uh, came to the realization after he wrote his last book on the Roman Empire that um, the Roman world did not actually lay the foundations for Western civilization. Almost everything that he takes for granted in the justice system and 
healthcare, in education, uh, in the quality of life, all of those things are the fruit of Christianity. And uh, so he, he decided to go back and sort of trace the, the, the emergence of Western civilization. And so he's exploring all of the stuff around the first through the fourth centuries. And uh, his, his realization was, whether you're a, a believer or an unbeliever, an agnostic or an atheist, you are much more Christian in the Western world than anyone in the ancient world was. Mm. Um, now, the reason that's really helpful for us is as we rapidly de-Christianize the West, we are rapidly de-Westernizing the mm. West. Mm. We're plunging ourselves into, in a sense, um, uh, uncharted territory, at least uncharted since the first through the fourth centuries. Uh, and uh, so to know all of that is really, really important. Uh, and to, to know what it is that we're headed toward and how to, how to deal with it. Um, our forebears learned how to deal with that. Uh, 14th century is really important. Uh, I mentioned that a second ago. Uh, that's that's the period of the bubonic plague, the Black Death, when a quarter of the population of the earth was wiped off the map. It's the period of the Hundred Years' War, uh, the growth of the Hanseatic League, the beginning of monopoly uh, mercantilism. Uh, it's the rise of, of uh, scholasticism, so ivory tower uh, sort of academics lording it over everyone. Um, but during the Hundred Years' War, which actually lasted for 130 years, uh, stretching from the end of the 13th to the beginning of the 15th century, uh, we see the two greatest powers on Earth uh, locked in the death throes of an unending conflict. Um, and uh, on top of all of that, the church uh, was crumbling from within. The Babylonian captivity of the church uh, the, uh, the the great apostasy, the splintering of the papacy into two, sometimes three, sometimes four factions, uh, each with their own pope. Uh, the, uh, the assaults of Tamerlane from the east, which threatened uh, the collapse of the eastern borders of uh, Western Europe. I mean, it was, it was tumultuous, but it was during that time that we have the beginnings of uh, what become uh, the transformation of the West through the Reformation. You have Wycliffe, you have Huss, uh, you have Gerhard of Grota establishing the Brethren of Common Life Schools, um, Martin Luther, uh, John Calvin, Theodore Beza, uh, Martin Bootser, they were all students of uh, Brethren of Common Life Schools. Uh, so 150 years before they lived, the seeds were already being sown for the recovery of what looked like the collapse of civilization in the West. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, those are those are periods that are really important to pay heed to. Yeah, yeah. We seem to live in a time, though, where it's difficult to ascertain true history. We We, we live in this time where revisionist history runs amok so we have odd things like columbus was just you know trying to discover gold or even now you know white people started slavery or just different things that are revisionist in nature how do we decipher and filter out um what is true history and what is the revisionist stuff that people are going are believing yeah, there, there are two things that are helpful. Uh, one is look at original sources. Mm -hmm. So if you read Columbus himself, yep. rather than 21st century critics of Columbus, you get a very different picture. Uh, we, we see this all the time. And it doesn't just refer back to, you know, the long ago and far away. Um, many are aware that J.K. Rowling, uh, the author of the Harry Potter books, uh, has been um, under fire from the woke police uh, 
because she supposedly is radically anti-transgender. Mm-hmm. But one of the things that's interesting is, is that no one ever quotes anything that J.K. Rowling has ever said that is anti-transgender because she has never said anything that is anti-transgender. <laughs> the whole thing is made up. So one of the things that's really important to do is look at the original sources. Mm-hmm. Go back and do your homework. Um, and w- we can do that whether it's about things like slavery um, and, and the origins of slavery and the, the abolitionist movement that, that emerged that started, by the way, in Virginia and Georgia. Mm. Um, we, we need to go back to those original sources and read those sources uh, and make sure that any contemporary books that we're reading go back to those original sources as well. Mm-hmm. So that that's one of the most important things. History, again, is not what actually happened. It's what we remember of what happened. And so we have to make sure that what we're remembering is accurate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, with that, what is the call for Christians regarding history? Um, should we be consuming it? Should we ignore it? Obviously, we shouldn't mm-hmm. ignore it. But um, in our daily lives, people that are out of school, should they still be reading history sources? Yeah, I think it's really important for us to know uh, the story of the past. This, again, is highlighted over and over again in the scriptures. Uh, you know, when um, when Moses came to the people of Israel Uh, with the commandments that God had entrusted to him on Mount Sinai, um, he he begins to elucidate. We we see this in the book of Deuteronomy. He begins to elucidate these things, starting with the Shema, uh, the declaration that we're to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And and then um, going through a series of commands about uh, what what it is that the people uh, should do when they come into the land uh, that the Lord was giving them. And the end of that section in Deuteronomy chapter 6, there's this really interesting scene. Um, it says, now when your son comes to you in times to come and asks you, what do these mean, these commandments, these statutes, these laws that the Lord our God has given us? And then you are to say to your son, and this is really interesting, it's not because I told you so. (laughs) It's not because God commanded it. He says, when your son comes to you, you are to go to him and tell him the story of when you were in bondage to Pharaoh in Egypt. The, The whole idea there. It is that you show uh, the hand of God in history by telling the story. We need to know the stories of the heroes who have gone before us. We need to know the stories of those who have who have given us false narratives and have therefore steered us in the wrong direction. Uh, We need to be able to declare to our sons and daughters and to our own wavering, quavering hearts what the truth of God is as it's been fleshed out in space, in time, and in history. Um, In um, the Apostle Paul's exhortations to the Corinthians, uh, he comes to this one place where he talks about Um, the fact that uh, we've been given many, many witnesses throughout history. And uh, Paul says that we're to learn from this because these things are examples for us. And then he he comes to this one place uh, in the exhortation where he he, he essentially says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation will provide a way of escape also that you may be able to stand up under it. Well, that passage follows this long exhortation about history. Uh, That's a, a, a promise that a lot of Christians cling to 
but they cling to it out of context. What Paul is saying is, uh, look, no temptation is going to overtake you, but such as is common in history. So go know your history, and then you will be able to stand up under the temptation that you're facing now. So we have Old Testament and New Testament exhortations. Know your past, know your history, and it will serve you well. It's not just nice stories to know. It's not nostalgia or antiquarianism. Mm -hmm. It really is strength for today and hope for tomorrow. That's good. Yes. Why is it that that format of story is so compelling to us as humans? More compelling than do this, don't do that. What is it about story itself that um, is so inspiring? Well, first of all, it's the way God made us. Uh, God made us uh, to, to know story. It's part of the reason why when he reveals himself to us, he reveals himself to us primarily in stories. You know, our, our, our Bibles are largely story. Uh, Jesus instructs using all of these various literary devices like chiasms and acrostics and uh, parables. He uses those uh, because God has made us to understand time as a, an unfolding story. Mm -hmm. And uh, so stories always are compelling to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Um, so this is a hotly debated question, and we want your take on it. We'd be remiss if we didn't ask you. Is America a Christian nation? America is not a Christian nation. Uh, America has uh, foundations that were laid by Christians okay. uh, that have produced Christian fruit, and uh, America has uh, been a leading light of, uh, of gospel hope for the world. Uh, all of the things that we take for granted in our judicial system all of the things that we rely upon in our healthcare system, uh, the flowering of art, music, literature, and ideas, technology, all of these are the fruit of Christian civilization. Uh, but uh, ours is not specifically a Christian nation. And uh, progressively, we're becoming less and less Christian uh, with every passing day. And uh, it's not the fault of the secularists. Mm -hmm. Right. It's not their fault. It's our fault. Yeah. Uh, it's the fault of, of Christians. Uh, the church has not been faithful to uphold the standards of, uh, for, for instance, the creation ordinances. If we were clear about human sexuality and marriage, uh, and stood firm on human sexuality and marriage, then our culture would not be confused about human sexuality and marriage. Uh, so uh, while I am so grateful for our Christian forebears who have given us so much and such a rich legacy, uh, they, uh, they did not establish a Christian nation uh, they uh, worked hard to establish Christian institutions within the nation. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've got a job to do to restore those uh, foundations and to rebuild them. That's good. Yeah, that's wonderful. What are some of, to you, the most fascinating periods of history? Hmm. You know, I, uh, I, I teach a four-year cycle of, of classes and have for 30 years now, uh, beginning with Genesis 1-1 and going all the way up to the present day. So I, I have favorite little bits at, all, all throughout. Uh, I am uh, I, I love Scottish history. Uh, mm -hmm. I love Irish history. I am fascinated by uh, the history of the region of Moravia, Bohemia, uh, and uh, all the way up into the Netherlands. 
uh, that that's a, a particular fascination for me. I uh, have written uh, short books on the history of Russia, on uh, the history of Brazil. I so I I, I love all of do these, everything. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I do love all, all of those things, and I have bits out of each of those. You know, I'm particularly fond of the high medieval period mm -hmm. uh, in the West. Uh, the building of the cathedrals, the establishing of the chivalric code, uh, the foundations of uh, the universities. That's that's a, a fabulously interesting period. I love the story of the Crusades uh, and the recovery of the Christian lands of the Middle East uh, and uh, the planting of gardens and the building of castles and uh, cathedrals. Uh, throughout the, the Middle East. So the question, the question should have been, what don't you love? <laughs> <laughs> we should have done the negative portion. Or is there any area of history where you're like, eh, I don't care? <laughs> uh, probably not. There's lots of areas that I haven't explored very well yet. Sure. I just recently did uh, a series of talks on the the emergence of Antonio Gramsci's idea of cultural Marxism, mm -hmm. uh, the establishing of uh, the Frankfurt School influence on Columbia University and the reshaping of the public uh, school system in the United States uh, in the years just uh, after uh, the expulsion of so many intellectuals from Germany right before World War II. That's an incredibly fascinating period, and it's really important for us to understand because what the radical secularists did uh, under the leadership of Gramsci, whose uh, work really wasn't translated into English until Joseph Budajaj, our current transportation secretary's father, translated it uh, and made cultural Marxism uh, available to uh, the radical progressive left of our generation. But what, what he basically proposed was to steal the playbook of Christian discipleship. Uh, he essentially made the argument, uh, Marxists are never going to be able to accomplish the work of the revolution by force of arms. Mm. So what we have to do is we have to capture the culture and we capture the culture by capturing the robes. Mm. So what, what he developed was what I call the strategy of the robes. Capture the judiciary, capture academia, capture you know the, the, the realm of science, and if you can, capture the clergy. And once you've captured the robes, uh, you're just one generation away from capturing the whole culture. Mm. So understanding that really helps us come to the place where, you know, right now people are saying, how did America change so fast? Yeah. How do we go from uh, it being normal to affirm marriage to suddenly it's now uh, fascist to <clears throat> affirm marriage? Um, it, it happened, it seems, in a blink of an eye. Well, actually, it didn't. Uh, this has been in the works since Antonio Gramsci was writing in the 1920s. Okay, so would you pinpoint that as essentially maybe the downfall or the spiral effect that we start off kind of as a Christian nation to the 1920s? Or would you go back a generation or two before and point to that generation and say, here's where as a whole, not as a whole, but as as a as a country, we we have walked away from the Lord and we're not upholding the law and biblical morality? Yeah, I think... Um, we have to understand there are always precipitating factors. Mm -hmm. uh, the Civil War was so disruptive and so destructive, so polarizing, that it, it weakened the foundations. It didn't destroy them, but it, it greatly weakened the foundations in North and in South. And you have the emergence immediately after the Civil War of all of these utopian movements, uh, what today we might call cults. Uh, and those utopian movements sort of sucked the lifeblood out of the most vibrant 
um, Christian communities mm. uh, burned over district um, in uh, in the Hudson uh, River Valley and uh, produced one cult after another from Mormonism and uh, Seventh-day Adventism uh, across the board to Christian science and a host of unity, a host of others. So th that's a precipitating factor. We have this weakness and into the void of vibrant uh, Christian thought, you start to have from Europe the, the, the importation of radical ideas from uh, everything from uh, biblical critical theories uh, to things like uh, reformatted Marxism. So you have these anarchist movements led by uh, the IWW and the Wobblies and uh, Bill Haywood and Emma Goldman and eventually uh, people like Will and Ariel Durant and Edna St. Vincent Millay and Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood. So all of that is taking place, and that's before World War II. But America, although these movements are, are sort of active and at work, most of America is paying no attention whatsoever. It's not until after World War II when uh, the Frankfurt School, Gramsciite intellectuals gain absolute authority in academia, and they start training the next generation. So after World War II, the training of the next generation produced all of the professors that would be in the universities in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. And they're writing the books that, uh, that uh, essentially espouse uh, free love and free sex and uh, and ab abandon materialism and uh, undermine the West and question authority and uh, dispense with marriage. All of those kinds of things start to foment in the 60s. Still, most of America is not heeding it, but a whole generation is shaped by it mm -hmm. so that by the time we get to today, those people that are at retirement age or older, but they have seeded those ideas into the culture the, over a whole generation. And uh, behold, here we are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do we do now? <laughs> what is, where do we go from here? Can we? And like you, we're overall optimistic about the end of history. Uh, right. It's it's right now this period that we're under judgment. People don't know a male I, from a female at this point. I mean, it's clear that our that at least the country, I don't know the world, but our country is under judgment. Right. Like she asked, what do we do now? Do we run the playbook that they ran, but use the Bible, <laughs> essentially get into the universities, become professors, get into every sphere of life, go full Kyperion? Yeah, well. Yeah, for, first of all, yes, we, we go full on Kuyperian. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Kuyper was uh, so spot on that when Hitler invaded uh, the Netherlands uh, at the, uh, you know, the sort of the beginning of World War II, one of the first things that the SS was charged to do was to seek out all of the leadership from the Free University of Amsterdam uh, and all of the people from the, the dissenting church in the Netherlands and uh, get rid of them. Mm. I mean, that's really the story. We're all familiar with the story of Corrie ten Boom yep. uh, and uh, the hiding place. She, she was a Kuyperian. Her father was raised uh, mm. in that Kuyperian tradition. They they were targeted specifically because they they were Kuyperian. So so yes, we need to go full on Kuyperian. Um, Abraham Kuyper lays lots of foundations, but we can get a lot simpler than than talking uh, in terms that most American Christians have no idea what sure. we're talking about. Don't yeah. know Kuyper <laughs> from a break it down. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. So, still all of this. <laughs> So the chief end of man 
is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Our first job is to put first things first. Uh, part of the problem of, of Christians is that we've been so fretful and so worried about our culture that we've forgotten our first love. Uh, we have a caveat to the world in our joy. Mm -hmm. And so what we've got to do is we've got to stop wringing our hands and start uh, giving thanks uh, and lifting our hands in praise. Uh, that That's the first thing. Uh, secondly, we, we need to send a caveat to the world by countering all of the propaganda of the world by uh, getting married, having babies, getting them baptized, raising them in the church, discipling them well, uh, equipping them for the, the world, uh, making sure that they remain as untainted by wickedness as possible while at the same time having their spam filters on high alert for all of the pop culture nonsense. And that's the job of full-time parents. Yep. Um, and then what we've got to do is we've got to see our calling, wh whatever our callings might be, to, uh, to, to be a high calling of heaven to change the world one right thing after another. That, that's, that's our job. Just do the next right thing for the glory of God with a clear intention uh, to bring everything under the authority of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Long term, that will produce that kind of Kuyperian invasion of culture where uh, we regain uh, the robes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Kuyper had to establish his own university to do that. <laughs> he had to establish a network of schools to do that. He had to plant churches to do that. Uh, he had to raise up the next generation of scholars, men like Herman Bavink, in order to do that. Uh, it's because of Abraham Kuyper that we got Bavink. It's because of Bavink that we got Van Til. It's because of Van Til that we got Francis Schaeffer. It's because of Francis Schaeffer that we got R.C. Sproul. It's because of R.C. Sproul uh, that we uh, now have uh, things like Reformation Bible uh, Bibles to, uh, to to study the the Word of God through the lens of the Reformation. Right. We've got to start thinking in that multi-generational fashion. Mm -hmm. So you've been teaching for a long time, and in the stratosphere that you're in, the circles you run in, do you see any progress in, say, the last 10, 20 years in this, or are we at foundational level kind of building that we need to be doing? Do you see good things going on, Bad, uh, a mix? What do you see? Yeah, I, I, I see all kinds of good things going on. I, I know a little bit about the church that you go to. Our church um, is uh, one of those where you go out into the parking lot and you go, wow, look <laughs> at all of the vans. Yeah, that's right. That's well, right. Look, at, look at all of the, the uh, giant minivans filled with kids. Yeah. That's progress. Yeah. Um, it's progress to know that those vans full of kids are all being instructed either at home or in Christian schools. It's progress to know that these are uh, families that are taking seriously the call to raise up the next generation of leaders. I, uh, you know, have been privileged to see multiple generations uh, go through our Christian schools and our homeschool umbrella. And uh, we we now have uh, children of children that uh, that we educated uh, now teaching in our schools. Uh, graduates from our schools are now the teachers in our schools. Mm. Uh, and uh, so we're, we're we're beginning to see, the, the real fruit of these efforts, but we're in the early days. We are in the early days and we have to, we have to be patient and not despise the day of small beginnings. And we have to build for the day that we will not actually see. Yes. Yes. Oh, and that goes in line with his, yeah. go ahead, you do it. <laughs> you tell a wonderful story about people who had that kind of foresight um, specifically with building a cathedral. 
Do you know which one I'm referring to? Teach I do. It's, it actually wasn't a cathedral. It was a dining hall. Oh, okay. Oh. You're talking about the story of the Oak Beams? The story that you told on Teach All Nations? Uh, but the cathedral that took about 400 years, the people would come out. It was generations. Oh, okay. That's that, that's a different story. There's, Sorry. Sorry. There, there are two stories that I love to tell them. <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the one that you're talking about was a cathedral. Uh, it's the Stephenstenplatz in, uh, in Vienna, uh, where uh, they could not afford the brilliant architects that many of the other communities uh, were able to have with the master masons. And so the town just committed to build St. Stephen's Cathedral themselves. <laughs> it took them more than 400 years. So generation after generation, every single day, all the men from town uh, would finish their day's work and make their way over to the construction site, and they'd go to work. Uh, and they did this for generations. Um, wives and, and daughters and children would come to the, the construction site with, uh, with sack lunches and dinners, and uh, they simply committed themselves to this multi-generational task. Uh, you can imagine, 400-year-long project, that's not the kind of thing that most American evangelicals uh, would put up with, <laughs> but uh, but it's it's an extraordinary picture of of a willingness to build for the day that we will not see. The other story is the story of a dining hall uh, in uh, at Oxford University uh, in the 1960s. Uh, this uh, magnificent 14th century, uh, uh, late 14th, early 15th century building, the uh, the oak beams were starting to crumble with dry rot. And so the trustees of the university sent out uh, to get bids for the kind of oak stock that it would take to replace the beams. And uh, they couldn't find any oak beams that big sufficient to restore the whole uh, dining hall. So they started to think that they were going to have to do some sort of, of artificial beams or whatever. That, and they became desperate. They, they actually put out bids all around the world. They could not find any place uh, to provide the oak beams necessary. Um, then one day, a janitor found the original plans for the building uh, in a leather sleeve that was stuck off in a closet in the basement. <laughs> uh, and uh, he brought it to the trustees, realizing what he had. Uh, they, they laid it out, and they realized that uh, there was a planting scheme that all of the trees and all of the plants for all of the college uh, would uh, be regularly replaced in certain intervals. And there was a notation that said that in about 500 years, the oak beams would need to be replaced, which is <laughs> why the oak trees had been planted all along the side of the college. And they're looking at the plants and they look up and there are the trees. <laughs> Wow. They planned 500 <laughs> years ahead. We have a difficult time planning one year ahead. I say I was going five minutes. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's awesome. Wow. That's amazing. Tell us about your reading habits. Are you a Teddy Roosevelt kind of one book a day guy or what, what kind of, what is your routine? Well, I typically have four or five books going at, at any one time. And That's so <laughs> I, uh, I try to have a fairly balanced diet when I'm working on a project. Uh, right now, I'm in the midst of uh, doing a new edition of Isaac Watts's uh, On the Improvement of the Mind. And oh, wow. so I'm doing lots of research on Isaac Watts and 
uh, his whole program for classical education and learning languages and and all the rest. So I've been plowing through as many uh, biographies of Isaac Watts as I can find uh, and reading lots and lots of uh, his other books. He wrote uh, more than 30 books besides the fact that he was the father of uh, – of English hymnody. Mm -hmm. um, so I've, I've got multiple things going, you know, all the time. Our home is uh, filled with, uh, with books in almost every nook and cranny. <laughs> and, uh, so, but uh, you know, to, to read substantively and to read well, you have to block out time for it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, early in the morning and then uh, at certain intervals through the day, I never go anywhere uh, without books um, because if I have to sit and wait in line somewhere or, you know, just, uh, in, just I'm waiting for somebody to show up for a meeting or, or whatever it is, I'm, I've always got uh, something to, to keep me productive. So you're not whipping out your smartphone and endlessly scrolling like everybody else in the world, <laughs> I'm shocked. Well, I, I, I do have a smartphone, and uh, we we are taking advantage of good technology for for this interview. I've got my right. Studio Mac uh, right here, which is why it can follow me around. Yeah, as I say, that's pretty nifty. Uh, yeah, in that in that need, that is cool. <laughs> yeah. So, but uh, but no, you know, there's. Nothing that replaces both reading and writing. I don't use an electronic calendar. I use wow. a regular old, um, you know, pen and paper. Uh, so when calendar. you said you pinned us in for today's uh, podcast, you really mean you pinned us in. I pinned you in. That's exactly right. <laughs> wow. That's right. That's great. That's awesome. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the founding fathers? Do you have any favorite founding fathers? My favorite founding fathers are the 15 presidents prior to George Washington. <laughs> um, <Okay. laughs> That's great. What a great answer. Have you given that answer before? Uh, well, I heard, I, I've listened yeah, to you for I, years. I haven't heard that one. That's good. Uh, well, <laughs> you know, George Washington was out <laughs> fighting the British for all of the years that back uh, in either Philadelphia or uh, as they moved around sometimes up to New York and uh, other places, we had a Continental Congress uh, that became the Congress of the United States of America. Uh, and they had a constitution. It was called the Articles of Confederation. Mm -hmm. And under that constitution, there was a uh, a one year long term for the president of the United States. First president of the United States was Peyton Randolph. Uh, the second uh, president of the United States was Henry Middleton. The third president of the United States was John Hancock, which is why his signature is so big and centered on the Declaration of Independence because he signed it first on July the... 4th, 1776. July the 8th, right. 1776. It was drafted on the 4th, but he didn't <laughs> sign it until the 8th. Most of the others didn't sign until late in July or early in August because it wasn't until August that it was made public. So um, John Hancock, he's followed by John Jay, and then there's Henry Lawrence and it's just this long line of great heroes that are oftentimes forgotten. Mm -hmm. And these are the ones who actually put together the alliance that held together 13 very diverse colonies, forged them into 13 very diverse states, gave them a constitutional structure, a legal foundation, uh, raised the funds to make sure that the Continental Army could function uh, communicated with Washington, gave him commands from Congress, and eventually were able to defeat the greatest military power that the world had ever seen. Mm -hmm. Those 15 people need to be known. 
I love those guys. Yes, yes, that's very good. <laughs> that's wonderful. So not Grover Cleveland, not Chester Arthur, not any of the guys after Washington. It's the guys before. Yeah, I, I, those are my favorites. Now I, I okay. do have, I, I do love Calvin Coolidge, uh, okay. uh, my favorite uh, president besides Teddy Roosevelt. Yeah. Uh, I, he he was an astonishingly great leader and. Uh, wise and frugal leader mm -hmm. and um uh, so yeah yeah there's there's some great heroes in there that's good wonderful do you have um a recommended reading list somewhere online Most yeah, uh, recommended reading lists yeah i have multiple um uh, recommended reading lists i i did a book club for years called uh sterling bridge and so all of the books that we did over the course of four years with Sterling Bridge are all recommended. I did a book uh, with my wife uh, years ago uh, called Shelf Life. Uh, and in that book, we profile all, all kinds of different things about the reading life. But there are some great fiction, nonfiction uh, reading lists, history reading lists that are in that book as well. Awesome. All right. Good to know. Should we be reading poetry? And if so, where should we start with the poets? Great question. Yes, yes, and yes, you should be reading poetry. The Bible is full. I knew of you were going to say yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, my favorite collection of poetry is the Oxford Book of English Verse edited by Arthur Quiller Cooch. There are multiple newer editions of the Oxford Book of English Verse, but the Quiller Cooch version is the best. Uh, and it's still in print, but I love the antiquarian copies. Uh, they're wonderful. And you can usually find them for less than the cost of a brand new hardback. Um, so that's that's the place that I would go. And that that takes you through English poetry from... Uh, the end of the Middle English period all the way up through uh, the middle of the 20th century. And so you'll get all of the Wordsworth and Coleridge and Milton and Pope and Addison stuff, uh, but you'll also get G.K. Chesterton and Elair Belloc on one end, and uh, mm -hmm. on the other end you'll have uh, everything from Spencer to Shakespeare. So it's really, really good. Arthur... Quiller Cooch. Arthur Quiller Cooch. All right, good. Do you have a favorite poet, like of all time? Probably it would be G.K. Chesterton. Hmm. Yeah. His intro to uh, The Man Who Was Thursday, the poem that is really a letter to his uh, friend Edmund. I was going over that one the other day. So good. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so good. And his, you know, you, you can't enter into Palm Sunday without reading his wonderful poem, The Donkey. Uh, it's just uh, it's it's just delightful. But I also, uh, I really do love, uh, as a poet, Arthur Quiller Cooch, who was the editor of the of the collection. Uh, he has uh, he has a number of just astonishingly wonderful uh, uh, poems. One of the things that he did was uh, as uh, as college student, he wrote parodies of the great poets. Uh, so he did poetries of Sir Walter, uh, uh, parodies of Sir Walter Scott, of uh, Coleridge and Wordsworth, and they are hilarious. They're <laughs> wonderful. I'll have to look for that. Yeah, we will. That's good. All right. So the greatest story, we've been talking a lot about story. The greatest story is the gospel. Can you share the gospel with us? Well, the, the, the gospel is uh, technically the whole story of creation, fall, redemption, and consummation. Uh, so the whole Bible, it tells this one story. Uh, and this one story has as its climax, as its consummation, uh, where we see prophet, priest, and king embodied in one person, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, who... Uh, though being equal with God, did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but instead he was made in the form of a servant. Uh, and he bore uh, the ultimate penalty for our sin, uh, 
he took on our iniquities and he was uh, he was bruised for our wickedness uh, and in this incredible double transfer he who committed no sin gave us his righteousness and he took upon himself our wickedness and as a result uh, though we should have been dead in our trespasses and sins he bought us back from the slave market of sin and set us free. With his resurrection, he defeated death. And with his ascension to the right hand of the Father, he now rules and reigns the nations, uh, which are the inheritance that he has obtained from the Father. Uh, it's an incredible story. Um, and it starts in creation, and it goes all the way to the consummation of the age. It's beautiful. It's go good. So good. All right, we're going to do a lightning round with you. Feel free to give short answers, a simple yes or no, or you can go in depth if you want. So this, this everything that we've done up to this point wasn't a lightning round? <laughs> well, I mean, for you, yes. yes most, yes. We know you could wax eloquent a lot longer, but yes. So this will okay, be- yeah. lightning round. Yeah, lightning round. So number one. Do aliens exist? No. <laughs> Coffee or tea? Coffee. Can you do your life in numbers? How long you've been married? Number of kids? Grandkids? Uh, 48, 3, and 1 in heaven, uh, 7. Awesome. Nice. Who killed Kennedy? <laughs> <laughs> This is one of my favorite subjects. Yeah, I I, I think Lee Harvey Oswald uh, is is the one, but he may have been in the pay or have been influenced by um, various incendiary um, movements. Yes, I'll have books I want to send you. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, go ahead. Oh, I had who was your favorite president? But you've already answered answer that. that. So next. Question. Yeah, Calvin Coolidge and Teddy Roosevelt. All right, so you get three characters in history to sit down with and have a lunch. Who are they? Oh, um, not counting Jesus and the Apostle Paul. Of course, and, of course, of course. Yeah, yeah. or <laughs> Isaiah or Jeremiah or <laughs> none, none of the obvious picks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, I would take uh, King Alfred the Great, um, Gerhard of Grota, and G.K. Chesterton. Wonderful. What's your favorite hobby besides reading? Uh, running. Marathons. Roughly how many books are in your library? Um, I, well, we just moved. We, we oh. lived in the same place for 30 years. And uh, we sold our farm and we moved into a smaller house and I got rid of thousands of books. Mm -hmm. So I'm probably down to less than 15,000 now. Oh, that's barely anything. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, your favorite authors. Favorite authors. Um, one of my favorite, uh, I used to say my favorite living authors uh, were Paul Johnson and uh, Colin Th Thubrin, but Paul Johnson just died a couple of weeks ago, so I can't say that anymore. Um, my, my my single favorite writer is G.K. Chesterton, mentioned him several times. My favorite theologians uh, are um, Thomas Chalmers mm -hmm. and Abraham Kuyper. Uh, but filtered through Francis Schaeffer and uh, Cornelius Van Til and a host, a host of others. That's good. That's good. Okay. Anything you want to plug? I saw there is an app coming out. Uh, Stand Fast app? Stand Fast app. Yep. yep. Georgegrant.net. Uh, you can find out about the Stand Fast app there. Uh, it should have lots of my talks and podcasts and all of that. I have... Uh, I do a, a a word segment on uh, the world and everything in it, uh, the podcast from World Magazine. I have a, a weekly podcast called uh, Resistance and Reformation, 
uh, which is kind of a church history tell the tell the stories uh, kind of podcast. I have uh, an, another podcast that's mostly my wife and I uh, discussing various issues called the Stand Fast uh, podcast. So beautiful. And then there's the sermons and the history lectures and all of that kind of stuff. That'll all hopefully somehow squeeze into that app. That's great. You're a busy guy. And we thank you so much for coming on our podcast, Dr. Grant. It's been a great delight. Great questions. Lots of fun. Awesome. Thank you so much. Bless you. Thank you for listening to the Love of Life podcast, Conversations with Jesse and Courtney. It is our duty through our schools to create a new one a God-centered one. We are told in Proverbs 8, verses 35 and 36, For whoso findeth me findeth life, and shall obtain favor of the Lord. But he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All they that hate me love death. 